Hello, thanks for coming. I'm Simon. I would like to talk a bit about desktop Linux platform issues today. So if someone of you doesn't like people ranting on stage about stuff that's not perfect, about stuff that's broken, about stuff that's not working, please feel free, leave now. <laughs> I do have a solution, uh, but that's not the main topic of the talk. It's really about pointing out what we as a community should think about and the kinds of issues that I think we need to solve together if we want to make Linux a viable platform for desktop applications. So a short background about me. I have been essentially a Mac user since forever and Mac is a platform where magically stuff just works, at least used to. I'm a Linux user since around 1998-ish, and I have been fascinated by Linux Live CDs right from the start, where you don't have to install stuff, you just boot up a Live CD or li later a Live USB system and just can start working. Also, I'm a distro hopper, so every time I boot my system, it asks me actually which out of hundreds of distributions I have on my system I want to launch this time, and I make a point uh, out of this. Also, I've been thinking about how to package Linux applications for uni Linux users for quite some time. Originally, I started the project called Click. This was 2004, which over time evolved into what is App Image today. This talk is not about App Image. App Image may be part of the solution, so if you're interested in that, um, we have a dev room upstairs uh, for everyone who is interested in App Image or packaging an application as an App Image. Be, feel free to step uh, to come by. But here, really, what are the underlying issues on the Linux platform? This is what we should discuss today. So I hope to keep the, my talk short so that we have lots of time for discussion in the end. Linux of on the desktop really is a niche in itself. Looking at the desktop operating market share, we see it's basically all Windows and Mac. With Windows over 88%, market share, Mac OS over 8%, this doesn't leave a lot for Linux, which is, depending on which survey you believe, somewhere between 2 and 3% as of today. And really, as an application developer, when you want to reach as many users as possible, it's obvious that you go for Windows first, Mac second, and then maybe you start thinking about Linux, and if it doesn't create additional work, maybe you consider to also go for these 2% guys there. But really, this is not the worst yet, because if you look into the 2%, that's what you get. Hundreds of different distributions living in different ecosystems where you have the Debian-ish ecosystem with Ubuntu and you have the Red Hat-ish with Fedora and CentOS, but really this is the family tree by now. And in the tradi traditional distribution model for applications on the Linux platform, you had to build for each of those and you had to target each of those hundreds of distributions. It doesn't stop there. For every distribution, you have different desktops. And some of those desktops are actually quite opini op opinionated as of today how applications should be made. And also, they start to have an opinion about how applications should be distributed. For example, there is elementary. Great operating system, great design, great usability, but they expect people to write applications for elementary OS, which is a tiny, tiny fraction out of the tiny, tiny fraction of the... Uh, market share that we just saw. Similar, GNOME expects applications to be written against GNOME frameworks in a very specific way. Right? So all of those desktops have certain ideas how applications should be written for Linux and how they should be distributed, but that is a bit conflicting with the view of an actual application author. Because if you look at it this way, the answer cannot be to develop each application for each distribution and for each desktop. Because if you do the multiplication, less than 3% times distro market share, less than 10% times uh, a desktop market share, it's nothing. You are not left with any users. So this led to the fact that even Linus Torvalds, who not only famously wrote the kernel, but also a dive log application, 
at some point stated that they are not distributing their own application for Linux. They provided binaries for Windows and for Mac, but not for Linux. Uh, and um, he went uh, on in public about this. He said, you don't make binaries for Linux. You would have to do it for Fedora 19 and 20 and Red Hat Enterprise. And then there is Debian with their rules. It's a mess and, and you don't do it. If you're interested in this on YouTube, he has a long rant. He goes on and on about this issue. So it's really worth seeing. I don't want to play it here now because language might not be suitable for all audiences. But uh, if you're interested, it's a great watch. So with this situation, it's really no wonder that we have no mainstream commercial applications. And I get it. Some people will say we don't need it. Fine. It's your opinion. I think it would be great to also have, in addition to the great open source applications, some commercial applications. You might work in a job where this is required, whatever. If I can do work on a Linux system that I would be forced to do on a Windows system otherwise, I will take the Linux system any day. So I would be interested in seeing this kind of applications, whether I personally use it or not. So real-world applications like Photoshop, there is no way they are made for each desktop. I mean, it simply won't happen, right? So even open source applications, sometimes it goes a bit differently than from what, how it was planned. Uh, Krita started out as a graphical application for the KDE desktop on Linux, predominantly addressing KDE users. But today, it has more downloads for the Windows platform by far than for any Linux system. And if you look at other real-world applications, what I tend to notice is that the applications I use on a daily basis, they are all cross-platform. They are all available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So there are famous names, Firefox, OpenOffice, Arduino, uh, Scribus, Electron, you name it. These applications are mostly written in cross-platform graphical toolkits like Qt, some use WX Windows, some use GTK. Increasingly, we see more and more Electron apps, and this comes with pros and cons, but it shows that there is a real need for something that unifies Windows, Mac, and Linux. Now, as an app developer, it is really key that you have a dependable platform on which you can develop, which allows you to reach a large user base, which allows you to produce an application in a supportable way, where you know my application runs on a, on a known infrastructure because you want to have as little work as possible as an application author. So when you think about what a platform is, a platform is really something that builds the foundation on top of which you run your own stuff. And the large uh, desktop environments that are successful in the market, they see themselves as platforms. Windows is a platform, macOS is a platform. About Linux, we will, we will have to talk, right? And yes, there is this increasing trend that um, Apple and Microsoft want to push people into app stores. But if you look at the reality, that's not what users really want. And also many application developers uh, don't really want. With Linux, we have a moving target here. And the moving target is not a good platform. Whereas here, if I compile an application on Windows, let's say 7, I can be reasonably sure that it will continue to work on Windows 7 and on Windows 10. Same for Mac. You can compile an application on Mac OS 10.9 and will run on all recent versions. On Linux, big question mark, because stuff can break, there are no guarantees. I mean, Apple announces years in advance, we are about to deprecate this and that, and you get an early warning in the IDE if you use stuff that's deprecated and they leave it there for years before they finally remove it. This kind of thinking is, in my opinion, missing on the Linux platform, where you just get something that's recent today and tomorrow you get something else and you have absolutely no guarantees what you can depend on. Linus also shares this view, by the way. Uh, he really 
thinks breaking the user space is, is really a bad idea. In his kernel wor work, he always uh, makes sure that nothing breaks user space, but at the same time, he notices that user space people break user space all the time. He explicitly mentions glibc here as an example, but there are many, many other examples. We will see some uh, really soon. In my opinion, breaking the user space all the time needs to stop. Now, I'm not the only one to notice this issue, and there are different approaches how this could be solved. One approach is to have the kernel, which has a stable interface between the kernel and user land, which Linux ensures. But then, as of today, in user land, we have a completely moving target. Now, what you could do is to ignore this moving target entirely, not use anything that comes with your Linux distribution in terms of libraries and infrastructure and services, just forget about all of that, and then ship a runtime that has essentially a second operating system, except for the kernel, which is defined. And that is what systems like Flatpak and Snappy do. Flatpak, you get um, a runtime that is really, that, that contains everything you would normally expect from an operating system, minus the kernel. Snappy, the same thing. Here it is usually built on some version of Ubuntu. And applications now can develop against these defined runtimes. The advantage for the application author is that there is something I can trust that does not change from today to tomorrow. But the big downside, of course, is that I'm essentially throwing away the real operating this system, the real stuff that comes with the distribution. That's only used for showing the desktop, essentially, and applications don't make use of this. So it's a lot of duplication. But it gets worse once applications over time require different versions of those runtimes, you have a nice collection of operating systems, <laughs> right? Over time, uh, you cannot ex uh, think that every application will require the same frameworks in the same versions, so this will really grow and grow over time. I think this is not the most elegant uh, solution to the problem. And I'm always an optimist. So I'm optimistic that by bringing in discussion into the open source community, we can end up with something like a guaranteed common Linux desktop platform. Because if you look at the distributions and what they are shipping, it's not so different. It's always the same stack. And some of the core components that make up a typical Linux desktop system we will see in a second. So really, if you look at Ubuntu, if you look uh, at Debian, if you look at elementary, under the hood, it's all very, very similar. For me, the key is to think about how to distribute a desktop in terms of thinking what a platform is. And the platform is something different from a traditional Linux distribution. Because platforms are something that allow authors to run additional stuff on top of. That's different from trying to get something into a distribution. A Linux distribution is built for shipping everything, building it in, and uh, requires an application author to get stuff into the distribution. That's not the platform idea. The platform says, I'm the platform. I guarantee you that I provide you this. Use it however you like. I don't care. All successful OSs, if you think about it, both on the desktop and also in the mobile world, are built this way. You don't try to get an application into the Android open source project normally, unless it's a very low-level piece of code. You don't try to get your software into Windows. You write software for Windows, you write software for Android. And that is the platform idea. Now, distribution people are really not working on solving this problem because they see it differently. Usually, a distribution cares about their own distribution, and that's all, right? But users care. I want to download an application on the day it is released, ideally directly from the application author. Application developers care because they want to reach as many users as possible with their application without having to do a lot of work and addressing each distribution individually. And finally, I think library developers should care 
but in sometimes they even can't. We will see uh, an example about this in a second. So today's distributions are not really optimized for running third-party stuff that is outside of the distribution. They usually want a package world for themselves and most make no guarantees in terms of what infrastructure they provide. A somewhat extreme example here is uh, coming straight from the Ubuntu wiki where they say normally and preferably software should be installed using Ubuntu Software Center. And the whole page explains why it's a very bad idea to run anything on your operating system that is not coming from Ubuntu. I think that's wrong. This is clearly not platform thinking. There are many, many reasons why this mindset is problematic. An author may just want to ship an application as it is without caring too much about individual distributions policies. An author may want to have some control over the downloads. For example, an author may want to count the number of downloads. Right? This doesn't work in the traditional distribution model. Or an author may want, for legitimate reasons, the user to pay before the user can download a software or to fill in a survey before downloading an application. Users may want to run many versions of the same app in parallel. This is also typically not possible in the way distributions manage software. You always have one version of an application and can update that. But for testing, for example, it, it may be very useful to be able to run as many versions as you like in parallel. And finally, a user may want to have the app in the instant it is released without having to wait before an application is backported to long-term stable or Debian stable or whatever. This comes to the point that in many cases a user may want to run software that's coming directly from an author. Distribution models, uh, the, the distributions should open up to be a platform that allow, allows for this. Most other platforms do. It's usually called side loading in the mobile world and I think this is very important as a feature for the Linux desktop as well. A key to achieving this is to constantly think about backward compatibility. I'm always a bit surprised when I see that someone writes an application and uses the latest versions of compilers and dependencies and libraries that are available because that in, is, in essence means that you will get into big trouble running this application on anything but the very latest operating system. And the reality is if you look out there, uh, your users, they will be using older operating systems typically. If you look in the enterprise world, it can be very old systems. So in my opinion, it is always important as a developer, as an application developer, to target the oldest uh, versions of distributions that you can uh, make your software work on. So only depend on stuff after you can be reasonably sure that everyone already has that. Or, optionally, bundle the stuff. If I absolutely need to have a version of a library that is newer than what Ubuntu long-term release or Debian stable has, then I have always the option to bundle a private copy of the newer dependency uh, to make the application run also on older systems. Now, library developers, uh, you would think that someone who develops a library like LibArchive is at uh, their own freedom to decide the version number this library appears under in distributions. Not so as of today. So this brings us into the middle of real world issues. And I've written down quite some of those. I won't go in very much into detail of each. But of course, you can download the entire talk. The URL is on, on each page here. Uh, the whole talk is available as a PDF if you want to dive into the details. Let's start with library file names. LibArchive is a very popular library that is installed on practically every desktop system out there. And the version is currently and has been for some time at version 3. 
But in Ubuntu 12.04, it's named libarchive.so.12. And on Ubuntu 14.04, it's named .13. On other distributions, it has totally different names. I asked the developers of libarchive to finally decide on a version number so that I can be sure that version 3 is there on all the distributions. They told me they can't do anything about it. The distribution decides the version number. I mean, this is crazy. Another example lip pulse common same game magia has currently version 10 but the app wants version 4 actually it's all the same version it's just differences based on some distribution policies this is no has nothing to do with the fact that these are actually different versions it's only about distribution packaging so someone should decide a sane system how we can ensure that the same version is named the same across all systems. We should find someone who, who can decide that. Library pairs, very similar. Uh, also here, there have been efforts like the file system hierarchy standard where a long time ago it was standardized where files in a Unix system should go. But as of today, distributions put libraries into different places. Debian, Ubuntu do it totally different than OpenSUSE, for example, and there are many other uh, examples. Someone, again, should do a new version of the file system hierarchy to standardize this, because there's absolutely no advantage in, in having this mess. It's just someone missing who says, we do it this way. So someone should do it. Or take this, certificates. Just look at where distributions put SSL certificates. It's crazy. Everyone has totally random locations where the same files go. So if you want to compile something that uses the certificates on all Linux systems, you have to deal with all those different locations. Again, I think there is absolutely no value in this. Someone should decide how it goes and we should just do it. Basic libraries. Again, if you compare different desktop Linux systems, you will find that the stack is extremely similar. There is a set of application uh, of libraries, sorry, that you will find on virtually every system. But it's just mainly and usually. It would take someone to really define what the basic libraries are and ensure that they are there all the time so that we can rely on it. Glibc is one of those libraries that are on every Linux desktop. Uh, I think this library has been under development now for tens of years, for decades. It is really mature by now. I would say it could be frozen indefinitely, only doing security fixes, but not really adding symbols anymore. But still, it's being worked on all the time. And I mean, Linux mentioned it, it can break from time to time. We should really think about how we can version this and, and have a version that everyone can rely on. glibc is comprised of many uh, parts. All of this, at least on a typical Ubuntu system, comes as part of glibc. So for a long time I assumed, well, this is safe to assume that these libraries are there on every system. And actually for over 10 years that was the case, until very recently when I found out Fedora 28 decided to just drop one of those. So libnsl.so1 used to be part of glibc until Fedora 27, but not anymore in Fedora 28. And guess what? There was no five-year warning period telling anyone about this. I just decided from today to tomorrow that that is how it is. So really, I think distributions should agree on what is part of the GNU C library and what we can take for granted. Someone should do that. Freeze it. Don't fiddle with it anymore. Another example is the C++ standard library. For some weird reason, it's always at version .so.6, even though it covers C++03, 11, 14. So it's constantly evolving what it actually is, but for some reason it's always under the same version number, clearly not following semantic versioning or anything like that. OpenSSL. Currently, um, you can't really rely on OpenSSL because there are various different 
versions that are incompatib uh, in incompatible uh, and that are distinguished by letters. So there is a version F and a version L and it's really a bit messy. So we should have a way to link against OpenSSL from an application and be sure that it works. I don't want to bore you with all of the details, but really the situation is complicated to say the least. Uh, this is from the Qt source code. So they do all kinds of weird things to check for libssl 09798 and compare what is there and then find one so not clean. There are many, many more examples like this. Um, again, someone should make sane decisions, should decide how often a certain application needs to change and then be ABI stable for a couple of years. I think something five years maybe might be reasonable uh, to have it in the system. If you need to make changes faster than that, it would also be okay to have more than one version in the system in parallel to say, let's, let's say 26 is part of the desktop Linux standard. Some applications want to use 28, install it in parallel. Not something most distributions do as of today. Usually you get just one version, that's it. Kerberos. If you compile an application today and your application uses curl for network access, most likely you will incur a dependency on Kerberos. Now I could ask you how many of you are actually using Kerberos. Okay, that's actually good. So something like 2% maybe. I think dependencies like these should be weak dependencies so that the other 93%, 97% in the room don't need to install it, but the 3% who want to use it can use it. As of today, the Linux system, uh, the, the way libraries are handled, doesn't, uh, doesn't really allow for this, at least in an easy way. The whole graphics stack, x11, xlib, xcb, this is also, in my opinion, basic infrastructure where I think there should be some uh, standardization. As of today, it's uncertain which of the many X components are actually shipped everywhere, what can be taken for granted, um, because it's really not standardized. Same goes for OpenGL and DRM. Same goes for ALSA and Pulse Audio, GTK Plus and GDK, GLib, and really all the text is if you are interested in the details, but the story is basically always the same. It's all basic infrastructure that you will find on every system, for example fonts and font rendering, every system needs to render fonts, there is practically only one library that does that, named font config. So why can't we have some standardization? Why do we have to run into issues like this, that some Pango FT has some half bus buffer set cluster level, all of a sudden a symbol that was introduced out of the blue. Uh, we should really standardize this. Someone should do this. Image formats, again, the same, very basic, TIFF, PNG, JPEG is on every system, except when it isn't. NSS, name service, switch, same game. Also here, subtle differences. They put libraries into very weird locations, subdirectories. Um, so really not easy. Um, same goes for Perl, regular expressions. So all, all, also on each system. Also here, the naming is totally random, the version numbers. And also, if you look into the details, why this is, everyone blames the other guys, but no one apparently can do anything about it, even though everyone agrees that it's a mess. Weak dependencies. We already mentioned this briefly. Um, SE Linux and App Armor are examples where some systems use these kinds of security uh, elements, but only some systems. And as of today, I need to decide when I compile an application whether I want to compile dependencies on those libraries in or not. I think things like that should be optional so that I can have weak dependencies that make use of 
as eLinux or AppArmor infrastructure if it is there on a system, but still work if it's not there. Now we come a bit into the area of user experience. Um, this goes back to the beginning. If you see a platform as something that makes it easy to run stuff on top of, not just what comes with the system, but stuff that you run from the outside world, it should be easy to run that stuff. But this is actually what happens if you run an executable, an ELF file, on a Linux system where the executable bit is missing. It's telling you there is no application installed for executable files. Do you want to search for an application to open this file? Makes no sense whatsoever. So actually someone from the GNOME community has made the proposal that there should be a box saying this binary file has not been marked as trusted. If you know the source of this file, running it as a program may be, if you don't know the source of this file, running it as a program may be unsafe. You can then click here, trust this file, make it executable and run. This is much, much more user friendly. But again, this is just a mock-up. That's not what happens today. So someone should make sure that basic operating system stuff like this is handled better. SE Linux, I don't want to dive into details here. Uh, Fuse, similar, uh, Fuse is a mounting system for mounting file systems in userland. 95% of desktop distributions come with it, but still it's missing in 5%. Would be great if functionality like this could finally just be uh, taken for granted and work everywhere. Compilers. Now I have to preface this, I'm not a compiler expert, so I can only say what I would wish uh, would be the case. I'm not sure it's technically possible, but if I compile something today on a certain compiler, it can happen that the compiled binary has a dependency on a certain version of, for example, the lib standard C++ runtime. It would be great if there was some decoupling so that the version of the compiler used would not determine what kind of libraries go into my end product. GStreamer um, is a basic piece of infrastructure for handling multimedia. Uh, again, the usual mess with the file names and paths, I don't want to bore you. Wayland uh, is the new display server. More and more distributions are shipping this now by default. And in my opinion, distributions should really make sure that existing X11 applications run, just work as always without any manual additional intervention and without having to configure anything. So distributions are not entirely passive on this, especially enterprise distributions, because companies actually don't want to upgrade their system all the time. The companies usually don't want to run rolling release distributions. They want to install something now and then be sure that it works for a long, long time. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux actually makes some enterprise Linux platform guarantees. And I find that very interesting. So there are different compatibility levels. And the core libraries are intended to preserve binary compatibility across three consecutive major releases. Now, major releases um, in Red Hat, something might be, hello, test, test, is it working? Should I take, okay, all right. So if you are familiar with, uh, distribu with uh, Enterprise Linux, you know that one major release uh, is active for a long, long time, so uh, years and years. But now let's see what is part of that uh, compatibility level one. It's actually not much. This is Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux 7, and you see this is extremely basic. Um, our Some of our favorites are there, like lib standard C++, uh, like GTK, interestingly GTK2. Uh, GTK developers are now talking about 4, I think are developing 4 and are talking about 5 at this moment. Sorry? Right, they are aiming for the long run, which is not a bad thing, right? But maybe the desktop is more than these few libraries, right? 
So someone should take this to the next level by, first of all, not making it distribution specific. This is only Red Hat and I just decided that this is the set they deem the right set. This should be community driven in my opinion. And secondly, the typical desktop stack is much more than what's shown here. So someone should really define this community wide. If that's an excellent question. We will come back to that. <laughs> so GTK3 at this point is still in compatibility level 2, which means if you compile something with GTK3 on Red Hat 7, you have no guarantee that it will still run on Red Hat 8. Now what? If I want you to take anything from this talk, it's really thinking about the Linux desktop as a platform, which means to think about it as something that we can take for granted rather than a moving target. Backward compatibility is key. And we need to think about the least common denominator that is true for most of the desktop systems out there. We need a new standard body that governs the Linux desktop platform. And the gentleman here in the first row asked exactly this question. Someone should, but who? I don't know, but an obvious choice might be Linux Foundation, right? Linux Foundation these days are more interested in servers, containers, Kubernetes, so doesn't seem like they are interested in the desktop so much. Maybe XDG, the cross desktop project. I'm not sure whether it's still alive but it's consisting mainly of desktop environment people. So GNOME, KDE people, app developers don't seem to be really represented there. Uh, also app users don't seem to be represented there. Linux standard space was a project that went into a very similar direction. They defined what set of libraries should make up a compliant distribution. It was at back at the time consisting mainly of distro people, also few app developers and app users, but also I don't know whether it is very active anymore. Uh, at least it seems like not too many people care. So I haven't seen so many applications that are compiled to be LSB compliant, unfortunately. So I would love to give you the definite answer on who should govern the Linux desktop platform, but I'm convinced that as long as we don't find coherent leadership for the user space, as it exists in the kernel space, it's no wonder that it's a mess. Now, I mentioned in the beginning, there might be a partial solution. And the partial solution, at least the best I could come up with so far, is to look at the le least common denominator of all the systems that we have out there by ch basically comparing them and then by packaging an application in a way that only what we can take for granted on each of the target systems is used from the system and just privately bundle all the rest. In fact, that's exactly what you would do on Windows or on the Mac as well. And one project that does it is AppImage. As I said, there is an AppImage developer room, so if you are interested in this and maybe want to package your own application, feel free to come to the developer room and we can go into details. But with this, I would like to open the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, this is actually stuff that keeps me literally up at night. Uh, I have more of a comment than a question. Uh, in pretty much the entirety of the talk, you say somebody needs to decide this, somebody needs to decide that. The entire reason this talk exists is because somebody got up and said, well, I'm going to do this, and somebody else decided they're going to do that. Deciding is not enough. We need somebody who, like Linus, is able to decide to put the users ahead of his convenience. Do you see this happening with any of the current structures that we have? Because pretty much everything is about rockstar development these days. 
So if you look at the kernel, the kernel is one project. It's a large project, but still it's a hierarchical project with one clear leadership. If you look at the all the components that make up the Linux desktop, the user land, it is not one project, it's many projects. So I can't imagine someone to step up and have authority over all those projects, basically dictating what needs to happen. The only thing that I can imagine works is that a standard is proposed, application developers start adopting this standard, and all of a sudden the dynamic shifts. Because if then many, many users want to run applications that are written against that standard, and distribution X or library Y doesn't support it, they have a bug report. Um, I'm just a regular user and not so much of a developer, but in my opinion, um, it's first that there's no intention against that because there's no big money there, there's no large platform. Red Hat even, even Red Hat just only cares for the service. But I think when you look at larger projects like Qt, you have a um, large platform, the platform is compatible until the next major release, you can develop your app, you can do anything, it doesn't break. Um, in my opinion, we should have something like that, that like something desktop independent. What I want to say is when you develop an app against Qt, against KDE, what wants to develop a platform on top of Qt, because Qt is not a full platform, uh, you can just compile the app and, and it will run. K5 is about five, six years old, and I can uh, um, compile an app that's so old, started at the first release, and it's compatible still. I think, um, um, yeah, I think that's, that, that's in, Ich habe ein bisschen Probleme, mich auf Englisch auszudrücken. No, pro no problem. I think I, I heard two points here. Number one, big corporations can set standards better yeah. than a community. And actually, we Red could... Hat does it. We, we uh, could I use Arch and the disruption always aligns with Red Hat because that's where the money lies. And yet, that's why I, what I wanted to say. When you look at GNOME, you had, you had uh, the example there of XG, XCG. Uh, XCG is like the name, but mainly the stuff that happens there is set by GNOME people, and GNOME people say, okay, this is okay, then it's okay, but when they don't say it's okay and uh, say that's not our opinion, they go, fuck yourself. They don't, sorry for my rude language, but that's exactly what happens when they don't yeah. want to do something, they don't want to do something. Right, that, that's what I meant with application authors are not represented in this discussion enough. They, right? they do, they... Uh, develop application, but when you want to use their application without GNOME, you have to do workarounds to make it look like... Yeah, I, I share this. This is what I meant initially when I talked about this cross-platform cross applications. Of course GNOME do their own applications, of course KDE do their own applications, and they are deeply integrated into the respective desktop. But then if you look at the real-world productivity applications, the larger ones, most of them are actually cross-platform. Right, if you look at the great number of uh, Electron apps, this is... That, that's true, yeah. So to, to your point regarding the large corporations, uh, if we as a community don't get this desktop stuff fixed, it could well be that something like Chrome OS will do what happened in the mobile space, where you have the Linux kernel running because that's stable, that's trustable, and all the other mess gets thrown away and replaced by something that is half proprietary. And I don't know whether we want that. Um, I'd like to question the original um, um, problem assessment a little bit, uh, because um, Yes, it is a mess, definitely. Uh, yes, uh, it makes it hard to actually program universally for 
many distributions, but um, we had many initiatives you already mentioned before, like LSB and so on, to unify this. They all failed. Um, XDG brought some standardization, but it's just a tiny little bit, uh, and it's mostly dead as well. Um, I don't think that can be solved because there's been so many tries within the past 15 years and um, the way it looks like is app image, flat pack and so on. Um, I think that's the way it goes now. The other mess is not going to be resolved. Your opinion to that? Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> you still hope to resolve it. I've been working on app image for the last 10 years and we have tried not to work around the system but really find the common denominator. The other two systems I mentioned, they basically gave up on the idea that there will ever be a common base and they just put in their own full stack. That's in my opinion giving up and I don't, I'm not ready to give up yet. <laughs> Well, it's a matter of definition, how big your base have to be. Minimalistically, it's a kernel. But that's not very useful on a desktop system. Well, okay. <laughs> the gentleman in the middle, no? Thank you. Uh, so there's this big trend towards containerization. How would you set that in perspective so it is a question what actually a container is for some time we even wanted to call this containerized desktop apps the I think one question is how much of the base system do you want to use I would say an application should not bring the whole world with the application which would be the typical container approach where you only use the kernel and bundle everything else so that's question number one. I think uh, the application should have something to rely on to not duplicate everything to have less bloat. Number two is the level of isolation between the application and the rest of the system. I'm coming from a world in which there was absolutely no separation. In fact, the first Macintoshes, there weren't even users. Uh, everything ran as root all the time. You can argue whether you want this or not. But my opinion is that at least for the desktop, if you don't trust an application and an application author, you should better not run the application at all. Because no matter what technical measures in terms of sandboxing you put in, if the application is malicious, uh, I mean, it can socially engineer you, it can use um, loopholes in the sandboxing. So, but that's my personal opinion. I don't need a high level of sandboxing for desktop applications because I decide whom I trust and, and what I want to run. But then if some users want to sandbox applications to try stuff out, fine. I think it should be optional though. I'd like to point out uh, about, uh, a fact about Windows and how it's not really a very uniform platform where you have several runtimes depending on the uh, year the Visual Studio was produced and most applications end up uh, bundling their own libraries. Uh, so in, in, in Linux world we don't even uh, have, I mean in Windows you, d you do have a couple of things which are standard which is the Win32 uh, API and uh, graphics libraries. In Linux we don't have that. And I would like to ask your opinion of how high do you think the base platform should go? What should be the components of the base thing to make Linux a viable platform? Okay, very tricky questions, not easy questions. So when I refer to Windows and also Mac OS uh, as typical platforms, I mean more in spirit than in good execution. So Windows, clearly no one has the idea that you need to get your application into Windows in order for it to be used by users, but everyone understands you have Windows and then you get the application from the author of the application and run it on top. Even though Microsoft wants to change this with the store, it seems to me uh, like user acceptance is not that high and people actually like to use the platform with side loading, with getting stuff from outside of Microsoft. So that's what I meant with this. Uh, it's, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Windows implementation is not particularly great at, at this platform idea. 
The second question. What do you think is necessary to ah, make right. Linux? Yeah, how high should we go? Excellent question. So I think there is obvious stuff that every desktop has to have, like font rendering, like um, codecs for multimedia, like uh, this display server printing. Uh, yeah, everything that basically you will find as a dependency in each and every desktop application. That is, and I, that's a vague answer, I know. So you could think about should GTK be part of this? Should Qt be part of this? I'm not 100% sure because if you look at real world Qt applications, oftentimes they are optimized for one specific release of Qt in this particular application, whereas another application that you might care about is optimized for a different version of Qt. So I think really we should have a look at what are the components that almost all applications require and that should make up the desktop platform. Any more questions? So um, maybe one question. The almost all, I think maybe it would be helpful if it's, if it's really just almost. Because I mean, there will be, when there's a certain adoption of this image app or something, then there will be pressure for the distributions to align with this. And I think that's maybe a good thing because it's, I mean, it's really messy and to clean up some pressure may be helpful. What's your thing, thought, thinking about this? Yeah, that's a very good point. So you're essentially saying as the system starts being used, there will be a dynamic that will lead distributions to comply. It's a bit of chicken and an egg problem because if I put out an application today, I need to make sure it works. Otherwise, everyone will be frustrated. No one will use it. So as an application author today, I can only use what is there in the distributions. And if the big mess is there, the same library under different versions, I will have to bundle this privately with my application, hence removing the need for distributions to align. So it's really a chicken and egg situation. Uh, have you tried to talk um, have you tried to talk to, to the distributions to align their library names? For example, the library names are itself a back compatibility against older versions. And it's like uh, uh, the German name is Teufelskreis, Devil's Circle, where you have chased you around and doesn't doesn't change. Right. So of course the library naming system, as it exists, has some valid thoughts behind it. There is a reason why it is like it is. But I mean, intuitively, the outcome of what we have today seems wrong. If an application author cannot say this is version 3 of the application and I want it named version 3 everywhere, then somehow the system is wrong. And I haven't found yet the right organization or person that could solve it. If anyone knows, <laughs> I'm really interested in who to talk to. I think the issue is when disruption, disruptions try to patch the software too hard when you're first look when you look, ex for example, for enterprise disruptions that patch the kernel very heavily because they rely so much on uh, on older versions to, to fix them and so on, that the software is going to modify it so much that it's not longer an upstream project. It's more like downstream modification and a mix. I, I think it's the idea of a disruption is great, but some disruptions do it too much. Ubuntu tries to be more Ubuntu platform, not not uh, Linux distributions. It's like it's like putting a knife against in uh, against other disruptions in the back of other disruptions. And um, about the library name thing, uh, that's is where, uh, where a package config is for, where you uh, as developer can get the right uh, library flags for your compiler and the right. Um, um, 
uh, include files and so on from from the from the library name and the developer has just to put this file in his project and the application can just use it and doesn't have to know where everything is i think it's a common base of every yeah. every library so what you mentioned distributions caring about their own distribution and not much else that is what i observe as of today but really i think it it hurts everyone because if you see it as from the perspective of someone who wants to do a cross platform application if this already 2% market share is subdivided like today, it's just not attractive. And I think the result is that we don't see many great applications that we would see if distributions would work together more. I think they hurt each other by this behavior. I think they want to hurt because uh, that's the systems the commercials do. Make things a little bit other. You could do it the same, but don't. You will lose money. Well, your argument is some, some argument that is very common in the commercial world, right? So if we are talking about commercial software vendors, I would totally buy this, but this is open source, right? This is supposed to be community. I know, but I have friends when I tell that other, our community in Cologne should agree how to handle beginners. You get a mess of options. And they don't want to say, as was said some time ago, um, we only have Debian, use it. Or when you don't use it, you get no help. And in the last um, weeks, I had an idea to do a software label activity. They had little ideas about that. But I think if you have a label by some uh, anti testing system, that would be the first step that you mention this test should run. Put it in Python, for example. Right, so a test uh, suite was, uh, I think it was Linux standard space, LSB. I think there were some tests that if the tests were passing, you could be sure that this application would run on all LSB compliant distributions. Unfortunately, and I don't know why that is, but unfortunately very few application developers actually developed against the LSB standard. That's a bit puzzling to me. Maybe it was too cumbersome. Maybe they just didn't care. I don't know. But I think you're right. We should have a specification. We should have a testing suite so that if you pass the test, you are sure that it runs on all compliant distributions. In the app pr uh, image project, we have something that goes into this direction. We call it app image hub, where we run a set of tests against automated, against every submitted application. And if it passes that test, we are at least sure as of now it runs on Ubuntu 14.04, which is an old distribution, right? But one could expand this, of course, in the sense that you just described. Responsible for the whole system since 25 years. And I think that is the wonder of Linux. And we maybe we should talk more, uh, more about such a wonder. That's an, the advice of an old man. Thank you very much. I think we have one last question. I just want to make one statement. Um, he just talked about the, about the wonder of Linus Torvalds that invented the kernel and so on. I think there's one big vulnerability here. He's just a man. He 
is not a god, he will die somewhere. So I think we have don't we have we rely on this hierarchical structure, and I think projects projects are vulnerable for for something like this. And I mean, someone will replace them. It's just it that's, that's no, will change not change anything. But the symbol is a, a great a great strength and. We will lose it when, when we so much rely on one person. That's a danger, I think. Very true. So, I said it in the beginning, I don't have the perfect solution, unfortunately, but I hope this talk makes you think a bit about this whole idea of a platform and how a platform is different from what we have today in terms of Linux distributions. Again, feel free to step by the App Image development room and we have flyers also here in case you're interested. Thank you very much for coming.